I titled this message, It Still Speaks. It Still Speaks. You know, sometimes it's really important that we make sure we're careful about the words that come out of our mouth. I've always been a big mouth. It's one of those places that I've had to guard my life. I have to be very careful, and as I've grown, I've become a pastor, I realize when I say something, it's magnified. I say something wrong, or I say something right. So I've learned to be a little bit more careful with what I say. So when we want people to hear what we're speaking, we have to make sure that we say it in a way that they understand. And when it comes to communication, not only do we have to say it in a way that they understand, but we also have to listen well. How many of you have learned that in marriage, that you need to learn how to listen? Guys, don't be ashamed to raise your hand right now, all right? I'm one of those guys, I would formulate my answer while you were talking. I wasn't really listening, and then as I grew older, I realized if we're gonna have good communication, I actually had to listen to the words that were spoken. This message titled, It Still Speaks. God is trying to convey something to us. He's trying to communicate something to us. Who's ready to listen with Mickey Mouse ears towards heaven? You're just ready to listen to what God says, amen. Before I get into it, I wanna tell you a little story about communication. Many, many years ago, my wife called me on the phone. And if you know my wife at all, she wears a perpetual smile. She's always smiling. And you can even feel her smile when she talks on the phone. You can feel it. She's happy to hear from you. She's happy to talk to you. She's engaging, even through the phone line, you can feel it. And one day, a long time ago, she called me and she did not have that tone. It wasn't the normal happy Patty that was speaking on the other side of the line. Something I knew was wrong. Her tone was different, she was serious. So the minute we started this conversation, like it put me up on my heels. I'm like, okay, what's going on? Something must be wrong. I wanna sing a song, something must be. But something was wrong when I heard her tone. And so she carefully construed her words, constructed her words and spoke to me and said this, Chad, even though we've already had three children, and you're medically cleared not to have children ever again, I'm pregnant. And so I'm like, okay, I believe in the God of miracles. He, he made the sun stand still. I don't know how this happens. I don't understand it all. But my wife just told me that she's pregnant. Mind you, I already have three daughters, Chelsea, Sierra, and Courtney, and we really did, weren't anticipating a fourth. And so I got down with her, I got serious with her, and I'm like, okay, Patty, all right, we're gonna have a fourth child, yay. And it kind of settled on my spirit right then, there in those moments, and I knew that she was pregnant, so I didn't wanna be anything but enthusiastic and supportive, so I was like, okay, babe, fourth child, I don't know how this happened, but it's a miracle. And I decided that I was gonna have another child, a fourth child. Patty and I together. And then Patty communicated to me, do you know what day it is? I said, yeah, babe, it's Tuesday. What's up? No, do you know what day it is? I'm like, it's Tuesday? And then in my man brain, I thought for a second, maybe she's trying to figure out how pregnant she is. She's trying to figure out how pregnant, how far along she is. So I'm like, okay, babe, like, what time of the month is it? It's Tuesday, that's all I know, tell me. You know, give me something to work with here. She said, Chad, what day is it? Then it dawned on me that it's April 1st, Fool, April Fool's Day. She got me good. She got me really good. I was, I was bought hook, line, and sinker. I was done. I thought we were having another baby. She's like, no, it's April Fool's Day. She got me good. How many of y'all know Patty? She can trick me because I believe her, amen? <laughs> She fashioned her words in such a way that I thought I was gonna have another kid. It's so important, the voices that we listen to. How many of y'all know in this day and age with all the philosophies, all the opinions, all the YouTube channels, all the TED Talks, it is so important that we hear the right voice. Jesus said, my sheep 
hear my voice. I want to read a scripture that talks about the blood of Jesus speaking to us today. Before I get into it, it's in Hebrews chapter 12. You can turn there. I want to give you a little bit of background. The entire book of Hebrews is about Jews that were tempted to turn loose of the name of Jesus and deny Jesus and go back to the old ritualistic system that sacrificed live animals. That was the temptation because the persecution came with the cross and so they were like, all right, we're gonna serve God in the old way. We're gonna go back to the Jewish system and we're gonna deny Jesus. And the entire book of Hebrews is basically the writer charging the Jews not to give up on Jesus, that he is preeminent above everyone. Moses, who obviously was highly regarded in the Jewish religion, he's above Moses, chapter one. He's above angels. He's above every other name that has ever been named. Jesus, you cannot turn loose of. And here at the end of the book of Hebrews, and man, do I think that's pertinent today. Y'all, the world is gonna try to get us to deny Jesus, but I didn't come up with a statement. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. I am the gate, I am the door. No one else can come up any other way. I didn't make up that statement. Jesus said it of himself. There's no other name under heaven given amongst men that by which we are saved except for Jesus, amen? And so I think it's pertinent today, here at the end of the book of Hebrews, where the writer draws the comparison between Mount Sinai, and this is where I'm gonna start reading, and the heavenly Jerusalem and the blood of Jesus. Who's ready? Say amen this morning. So we're gonna start right there in verse 18. For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and to a blazing fire and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind, that's Mount Sinai, and to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words which sound was such that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them. That's how terrifying this scene is, Mount Sinai. For they could not bear the command, if even a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. As opposed to that, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking, for if those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, that's Moses, much less will they escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven, Jesus. And his voice shook the earth then, and I prayed this before the service started, in the middle of the service, but now he has promised, saying, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This expression, yes, once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Father, I thank you right now that your blood speaks through the ages better than the blood of Abel, and I pray that your Holy Spirit would anoint what your blood is speaking, what your word says about your blood, it would anoint these words and they would penetrate our soul and our spirit, God, and we would be forever changed in Jesus' name. And all God's people said amen. amen. One more verse I wanna add, and this is all the way back to the beginning of the Bible. In Genesis, when Cain took Abel's life and Abel was dead, and God encouraged Cain, said listen, Sin is crouching at your door like a roaring beast, like a prowling lion, but you should have mastery over it. And then he took Abel's life, and God is saying this to Cain, and I believe he's saying it to some of us today. What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from 
the ground. I believe the Spirit of God is going to put his finger on anger, on anger, on anger this morning. I hope you hear me. So be reminded of the verse that Abel's blood spoke from the ground to God, but Jesus' blood speaks today down through the ages. Once and forever, his blood speaks. Amen. How many of you all receive that and know that to be true? Let me tell you, there's a lot of voices in this world, and you could get really confused if you listen to YouTube channels and all these people with all these opinions that sound like they're experts, very persuasive people that some of them are anointed by an unholy spirit. I believe that. But there's so many opinions and so much talk and so much you know, thought out there, you could get really confused. But there's a voice inside of us that we have to deal with. It's the voice of our conscience. Anybody else ever have their voice tell them, man, you shouldn't have done that? Anybody else? Or you should be doing this. The Bible tells us in 1 John that our conscience can either give us a license or can lock us up in prison. We can be so loosey-goosey with the gospel and the word of God, we can be so you know, tossed about by our own conscience that we deny the word of God. Our conscience can give us a license to do things that God's word does not allow. But the Bible also tells us in 1 John that we can be riddled with self-accusation, that our conscience can lock us up in a prison. I don't know about you, but sometimes my conscience does that. In a pastor's life, I always have a list of things that I should do that's longer than the things that I got done every day. It's sometimes hard to deal with. And I have to ask God by the Holy Spirit to help me because I should have made that call. I should have talked to this person. I should have shook that person's hand. I should have saw that person. I should have made sure that I, I talked to them. They're going through a hard time. It's really tough sometimes. But our conscience is not a good guide. Sometimes it gives us a license. Sometimes it gives us nothing but a prison. I got good news this morning. No matter what your conscience says, the blood still speaks. Your conscience is not a good guide. Sometimes it's unfaithful. Sometimes it's not something you can count on. Some of you, your conscience keeps you in order, but I want you to be like Paul. I want to encourage you to be like Paul. A human court does not judge me. I don't even judge myself. I let the Spirit of God judge me. Sometimes our own moral compass is not enough. We need the blood to still speak over our life. Are you out there and know what I'm talking about? Say amen. Our own conscience sometimes is not enough. The blood still speaks. First John says this, that our heart can condemn us. Some of y'all been sitting up in church for so long, but you quit years ago on really trying to be an on fire Christian and intimate with Jesus. You tried to pray so many times and you failed. You tried to get rid of that one stinking sin and habit for so long. Now you're still here. You're still showing up, but you quit a long time ago. The Bible tells us in 1 John, if our heart condemns us, if our conscience afflicts us, God is greater than our heart. Amen? What does that mean? That you are not the sum total of what you think you are. You're not the sum total of your performance as a Christian. The sum total of who you are is not how good you are or how bad you are. The sum total of who you are is the price that was paid for you. And the price that was paid for you is speaking down through the ages. You are the most valuable thing in all of the cosmos. God loves you and would have shed his blood just for you if you were the only human being. I used to not believe that. But there's no way that God can withhold himself from totally loving you. He's able to totally love all of us. He withheld nothing. He spilled his blood so that you can have a clear conscience. Somebody get happy in this place and say amen. Shout or something. I'm telling you, that's good news. That's good news. You aren't who you think you are. You aren't what your Christian performance is. 
I'm telling you, you are what God says you are, what the blood has paid for you. That's your value. That's who you are. Christian that's been blood bought, shout and say something. Say amen, amen. The voice of your past failures. Mm. Who's failed in their lifetime? Who has their hands down? I want to introduce Jesus. Anybody out there? Who's failed in their lifetime? Bam. Who's failed this week? Uh, didn't want to, but I did. You are not the sum total of your failures. You're not the sum total of your sin. Some of you have been struggling with the same sin for years, and your mind, that voice is saying, to this, saying this to you, you're a failure. You have failed. Your wife is better at being a Christian. Pastor Chad's better at being a Christian. What is your issue? Anybody ever thought they had an issue? I'm not afraid to admit it. We've all went to the mat fighting against sin, right? Just like Cain, it's crouching at the door. You've got to master it. He was encouraged without the Holy Spirit to master it. We have the Holy Spirit, and by Jesus' poured out blood, we can have victory. It's true. It's true. I love this verse in the Bible. It's one of my favorite verses. I believe, really, it's the verse that's the fulcrum, not only to the book of Romans, but the fulcrum to everything that's locked up in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it's Romans chapter eight and verse one. There is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. The blood of Jesus being spilled, it takes care of how you feel about yourself. Not only does it wash you and forgive you and cleanse you, but those feelings that you think that you're locked into, this is what I am, this is the kind of Christian I am. No, your value and your worth come from the spilled blood of Jesus. You are the most valuable thing in the cosmos. The Bible tells us to sell everything to get a hold of that pearl of great price, meaning Jesus. Can I tell you, he sold his field to purchase you the pearl of great price. He sold everything, spilled his blood and poured it all out so that you could be won back. Condemnation, guilt, and shame have no power over you any longer. Sure, you blew it. Sure, you've blown it for a decade with that one sin, but get up the next morning and know that you are alive unto God and dead under, under sin, and condemnation has no rule or reign over my life. I've been delivered from the law of sin and death, and I now am free in the spirit of Jesus Christ. Come on, saints. It's the truth. You're not locked into your failures. You're locked into the promise of God. Who you are is not that voice of past failures. It's the blood that's speaking down through the ages. That's who you are. Sons and daughters of God, do you recognize that this morning? It's what the blood has said over me. What does it say? You're a child of God? No, no longer bound to fear and slavery, I am a child of God. I love my three daughters. It doesn't matter if they robbed banks and went on an ax murdering spree, it would not change the way I feel about them. I love them, there's nothing that could change that. You are a child of God. Nothing will change about how he loves you. It's an unconditional love. Yes, you can go astray. You can be a prodigal son. You can walk away from God, but it won't change God's love one iota for you. You can do nothing to earn it. You can do nothing against it. You can do nothing for it. God loves you. Your value is the blood that he spilled in his love. Not only are you a child of God, you're more than an overcomer. Some of y'all gotta get up in the morning, get up in that bathroom and look yourself in the mirror and tell yourself that you're an overcomer. You've been beating yourself up so long, man, you gotta, you gotta recalibrate and reprogram your brain. You've been beating yourself up, I'm not good, why don't I do this, why didn't I do that? 
man, I find myself doing this. I can't believe it. I've been fighting with this. Sometimes you got to get up in the mirror and tell yourself, according to the word of God, what I am. I'm an overcomer. I'm going to overcome this sin. I'm going to overcome my bad habits. I'm going to overcome my idiosyncrasies that just bug everybody. God's going to help me get over the top. I'm going to be an overcomer. Tell yourself. Tell yourself. I'm more than an overcomer. And right there, lodged in the end of Romans chapter 8, you are more than a conqueror. Listen, I play pickup basketball. I played out at the South Mill Pond this week. Played for years competitively. And my middle daughter, all my daughters, but my middle daughter specifically, it's really, she's six foot tall. She's really getting in the WNBA right now because of Caitlin Clark. Anybody watch Caitlin Clark, some of her games? Man, I'll tell you, she's amazing. And I know when I'm out on that court, because I've played for so long, no matter if somebody's younger, lot, most of the players I play with are younger than me now, thinner, faster, okay, more skilled, all of that. But I can tell when someone loses their heart. And it doesn't matter how good they are or how bad they want to win, if they lose their heart, they're done. They're done. They're done. We gotta know deep inside, it just can't be some frivolous confession that we are more than conquerors. You gotta know that you're gonna win and you can't settle for anything less than winning in your Christian life. You can't settle for that habit being in your life forever. You can't settle for that sin and secret being in your life forever. You gotta realize that there's some kind of friction in your life between what God wants and where I'm at. And I know that he's the difference. He's the bridge to the other side. He is the way to freedom. The blood still speaks. I can pave a way for you to be set free. Listen, that's our testimony. That's our testimony. Woo, I'm excited about it. What about the voice of shame? Man, in our culture, you see all these people perfectly digitally brushed up and we can't help but fight the comparison. I don't know about you, but even in my life, it's like, man, I wish I could bake like Brittany Frazier, but I can't. Boy, I wish I could smile like Dylan, but I can't. Boy, I wish I was as quick as Jack on the basketball court, I play with Jack, but I'm not. Like we compare ourselves. Man, I, if my kids were just like Pastor Chad's kids, right? If I had the, the financial stability that this person has, or that, I should have done this. Look at those people are doing that. And shame, we shame ourselves into doing the right thing. I just want you to know there's a higher purpose. There's a higher way to be called to the right way of living. There's a higher call. It's called love. If you know the price that was paid for you, you will not allow shame to take one bitter rule over your life. You're not like everybody else and God created you that way and you're not meant to walk in somebody else's footsteps. Don't try to be them. Don't compare yourself to them. The Bible says when we do that, we become delusional. Forget about all that. Just realize that the blood was spilled on your behalf and God has a plan and a destiny for as unique as you are. He's gonna take you somewhere. Just receive it, just believe it. Walk in it and realize that you're special. You're fearfully and wonderfully made and God's thoughts towards you outnumber the sands of the seashore. He's not messing up. He knows what he's doing. Woohoo! Anybody else besides Pastor Chad said, I can't believe I just said that. Oh, I'm a pastor. Now, I don't swear or cuss, but every once in a while I can be a little strong. Anybody else besides Pastor Chad? Then in my life, it's always a dynamic. I should have done this. If I was a good pastor, I'm encouraged today because the blood speaks this over my life. My sins are removed as far as the east is from the west. That my sins are drowned in the sea of forgetfulness. When I have a hard time forgetting all the things that I've done in the past, everything that I should have done that I shame myself over, you know what? 
The Bible tells me as I begin to grow in the grace of God because of the blood of Jesus that I'm gonna forget the things that lie behind and I'm gonna press on to the high calling of God because there's a wind at my back and it's the grace of God that keeps me moving up higher and higher and higher and turning loose of my mistakes and the past. If you're a Christian and that's your witness, say yes, it's my witness. Man, I tell you, old things. Listen, this just can't be a Bible verse that we know we got to live in it. Old things have passed away. Behold, everything's new. We're going to receive communion in just a few minutes, folks. And I want you to know something. That is, that is the thing that changes us at the table of the Lord in communion. Old things have passed away. Behold, everything is new. Man, what a blessing. You can't be shamed into doing anything for Christ. It's before him that you stand. You don't stand before people, right? Amen? He is the justifier. He's the only one that can justify you before God. It's Jesus Christ and his shed blood. He's your advocate. He's up in the courtroom of heaven, and he's testifying on your behalf, not from things that you've done or not done. He's testifying about what he has done inside of you. He paid the ultimate price and now you belong to him. My daughters are my daughters. They'll always be my daughters. If an earthly father feels that way about his earthly daughters, how much more our heavenly father loves us and will never, ever leave us or forsake us. Like Paul, and I pray this is your testimony, I am who I am because of the grace of God working mightily in me. Anything you see in me that you think is righteous or pure or trying to be holy, it is the grace of God. You yourself, you wanting to pray, you wanting to come to church, you wanting to be nice to people, the fact that you're surrounded with a community of believers the fact that you want to call on God, that you even have a desire to do what's right, you're going to go to heaven one day. All of this is because of the blood that speaks through the ages. Everything that you have was won for you by Jesus. You did nothing to earn it. When we get to heaven, folks, we're not going to lay down our crowns of accomplishments we're gonna bow before Jesus and realize the magnificence of the plan of the blood shed for us. How many of y'all recognize that that's what's gonna be our, our verbalization? That's what we're gonna do. We're gonna praise God. I am who I am by the grace of God. One last encouragement. There's the voice of the enemy. I can tell you the last couple of weeks, like the voice of the enemy, like I can feel his hot breath breathing down my neck and I'm not exaggerating, I'm telling you the truth. Some of y'all don't think the devil is real. I got news for you. He is 100%, just as real as God. And he will speak over your life and try to tell you that the word of God does not work in your life. Just like he did in the garden. Did God really say? But you need to know because of the spilled blood, God's promises are yes and amen, right? Jesus said on the cross when he spilled his blood, it is finished once for all time. No matter what the devil tries to do, your life is a finished package as far as the promise of God. He's laid out your footsteps to get you to your destiny and he's paved the way and lavished the way with his grace, his blood paving the way the entire way and he made contingencies for every misstep, for every correct step, every bit of the way. He's made a plan so that that grace would carry you to your destiny. When Jesus cried out, it is finished, he could see the end from the beginning. He saw you called, justified, glorified. He already saw you in heaven and said, I'm speaking over your life. You are already a finished product. Folks, we have to have certainty in our spirit that God will fulfill his promises concerning us. The blood was spilled so that Jesus could say, it is finished over your life. The voice of the enemy would accuse you. The voice of the enemy would make you question God. 
But the blood is there and still speaks today to strengthen you, to empower you, to forgive you, to cleanse you, to make you a housing unit of the Holy Spirit. The blood of Abel cries out for vengeance. It spoke of anger and sin being rampant in humanity. And the blood of Abel cried out for vengeance. The blood of Jesus cries out for pardon and forgiveness. Christian, this last verse, we read it, verse 25. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those did not escape when they refused him who warned from earth Moses, much less will they escape and turn away from him who warns from heaven. The blood of Jesus speaks better than the blood of Abel. It speaks better than the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament. It was spilled on our behalf. Come on, church, stand to your feet this morning.